Good morning, everybody. We will continue our discussion on arrays, and today we will look at how matrices are handled in C programming language. Specifically, it is multi-dimensional arrays that we use. Multi-dimensional arrays is the nomenclature used in the C programming language. A specific subset of this, namely two-dimensional arrays, will be equivalent of our matrices. Since a large number of computational problems involve use of matrices, I will discuss matrix computations with the example of uh, a gauss seidel reduction. First, some preliminaries. To declare multidimensional arrays in C, we note that our arrays can have more than one dimension. As a matter of fact, there is no strict limit on the number of dimensions that you can have. But if you have a, an array with, say, 10 dimensions, it's not clear where you would require it, but you could have it. But the product of the sizes of all the dimensions will be the amount of memory that will have to be allocated. So that is something that you would like to keep in mind. A typical declaration could be of this form. So when I say A 50 comma 40, it effectively allocates memory for what we may conventionally call a matrix. The two dimensional array will have 50 rows and 40 columns. Each element of this two dimensional array will be accessed by a reference which now requires two index expressions to be specified. So in a single dimensional array, we said say roll i or roll j. For this two dimensional array, we'll have to say a i j. For example, we may have an assignment statement which says a i j equal to 37. In which case, what the computer will do is, it will calculate this index expression. In this example, it is simple i, but it could be i star 3 minus 4, whatever, as we saw yesterday. This index expression is evaluated and the final value becomes the element index for the row number. Similarly, the second index is evaluated and the final value becomes the index for the column number. And then once a row number column number identifies a specific element, that gets assigned the value 37. So please note that the name A does represent 50 into 40, that is, uh, uh, 2000 elements. However, A, I, J or any reference of this kind will refer to exactly one element, exactly one element, no more, no less. And that element will be identified based on the values of the row index and column index. We call it row index and column index because it's a two dimensional array. If it was indeed a five dimensional array, for example, we would have said the value of the expression for index 1, value of the expression for index 2, value of the expression for index 3, etc. Whatever be the number of indices, ultimately such a reference will refer to exactly one location. We note the usual constraints, which are same as those apply, which apply for a single dimension. Namely, that each index, whether it is a row index or column index, must be within the limits prescribed by the size declaration. So in this case, the value of i can range from 0 to 49 and the value of j can range from 0 to 39. And we note that all rules for index expression apply to index for each dimension. With this, we consider an important computational problem that arises in many applications which involves the use of matrix. We will specifically talk about representing a system of equations in multiple variables. This material is based on information provided in numerical recipes for C, C++, etc. I will show you the reference at a later stage. As I mentioned earlier, one of the best books I have seen, uh, which describes algorithms in details, along with a very detailed analysis of how those algorithms have been arrived at. So we continue our discussion with a simple example. We consider two equations in two variables. 2y plus 4z equal to 8, we call it equation 1. 4y plus 3z equal to 1, we call it equation 2. Actually, all of you will recognize that these are very elementary set of two equations and generally all our students who come to engineering college would have solved these kind of equations, uh, simultaneous equations very many times. 
here the objective is to demonstrate the use of matrices and the method of gauss elimination by working out that particular algorithm on this simple system of equations first and then generalizing it for a n by l uh, for a system of n simultaneous equations so we know to begin with that this system of equations can be represented as a coefficient matrix 2443 a matrix of the variables y and z and the right hand matrix which consists of 8 and 1 so we note that if there are two unknown variables and we have a equation system of two equations in two unknown variables then we get a 2 by 2 coefficient matrix please note that this matrix representation actually denotes 2 multiplied by y plus 4 multiplied by z equal to 8 essentially the dot product of the first row and the only column of unknown variables equal to the corresponding element of the right hand side forms equation 1 in exactly the same fashion 4 multiplied by y plus 3 multiplied by z equal to 1 formulates the second equation while our students may know matrices and this representation we can't make that assumption so it will be useful perhaps to extend this by describing what is a dot product even if the term dot product is not known they will know how matrices are multiplied so 2 into y plus 4 into z equal to 8 is what amounts to the first equation should be clarified having achieved this we proceed further to look at how this system of equation can be solved in particular we describe the gaussian elimination this method we observe depends upon certain standard facts there are actually two facts which will use which the gaussian elimination uses the first fact any system of equations is not affected if any one equation is multiplied by a constant that means the equation continues to represent the same factual position to illustrate we will say look at this equation 2y plus 4z equal to 8 we observe that it is same as 1 into y plus 2 into z plus 4 which we obtain by multiplying the equation by 0.5 if we did that we can now say that we have two equations 1y plus 2z equal to 4 which is the one which is derived from this uh, first equation by multiplying it by 0.5 we call it equation 1 dash and we have retained the second equation 4y plus 3z equal to 1 this is equation 2 at this time some students may naturally ask why are we multiplying by 5, 0.5 why not by 0.8 why not by 7.3 why not by any other number while it will become clear why we are doing this but we can very minutely very very uh, very subtly suggest that by multiplying this equation by 0.5 what we seem to have achieved is that the coefficient of the first variable has become 1 now this one has significance as we shall see later we then continue with equation 1 dash which is 1y plus 2z equal to 4 and 4y plus 3z equal to 1 being equation 2 representing these equations in the form of matrices we get this representation so the same equations we now say 1 2 4 3 yz equal to 4 1 notice again that people if they have not understood the notion of dot product we can remind them again that this matrix representation really means that the first row is multiplied by first column and is equal to first uh, element of the right hand side similarly the second row multiplied by first column Uh, that summation is equal to the second element. So 1 into y plus 2 into z is equal to 4 is our first equation, and likewise the second equation. We note in passing that the original coefficient matrix, had we represented the coefficients in a matrix form, would be like this. Why do I repeat this here? This is to show a comparison between what was the original coefficient matrix that we have. and what is the modified coefficient matrix that we have now derived we can again subtly emphasize to our students that ultimately when we apply the gaussian elimination method to a larger set of equations we would essentially be modifying the coefficient matrix 
and because of that modification we will also be modifying the right hand side matrix y z of course represent unknown which is what we need to determine clearly the objective is to find out what is the value of y and what is the value of z which together satisfy the system of equations so we got this equation 1 equation 2 originally in matrix form and this is equation 1 dash and equation 2 again in matrix form we now notice the second important fact that the Gaussian elimination technique uses. Namely, if an equation is replaced by a linear combination of itself and any other row, the system of equations remains the same. The word linear combination may not be very easily understood by our students. So, we say that we can, multi we can add or subtract from a row in a multiple of any other row. So, that is what is meant by a linear combination of itself and any other row. In general, actually linear combination could mean say k 1 into one equation plus k 2 into another equation. The form that we take is that we replace the second equation by subtracting from it 4 times the first equation. Again at this stage, the number 4 might appear to be an arbitrary number, but we will soon proceed to tell our students how we derive this number 4. In short, if these were our equations, equation 1 dash 1 y plus 2 z equal to 4 or now we can speak in matrix terms 1, 2, 4, 3 was our matrix and 4, 1 was the right hand side. I multiply the first equation by 4 and subtract from equation 2 the resultant combination of equation 1 dash multiplied by 4 and replace the second equation by that value. So, what do we get? The first equation stands as it is because we are not doing anything with it. 1 y plus 2 z equal to 4 remains as it is. What happens to the second equation? It was 4 y plus 3 z equal to 1. Now, it becomes 0 y minus 5 z equal to minus 50. Now, people can easily see what was the reason for the choice of multiplying the first equation by 4. In fact, we will remind our students that when they apply these principles normally while solving a simultaneous set of equations they would like to eliminate one of the variables. Here we are talking about eliminating the variable y. Since y has a coefficient of 4, I, if I multiply the first equation of by 4 and then I subtract that equation from this, I will get 0 y. So, when I sub multiply this equation by 4, this term becomes 4 into 2 8 z. When I subtract 8 z from 3 z, I will get minus 5 z. Similarly, when I multiply this by 4, I will get 4 into 4, 16 and when I subtract it from 1, I will get minus 50. So, it is a simple linear combination evaluation. We are using this fact which is a general fact and we are using this fact to reduce the coefficient of the first variable in the coefficient matrix to 0. In terms of matrices, this was our matrix. When I multiply equation 1 by 4, Basically, I multiply the first row by 4. When I replace the second row by subtracting 4 times the first row from itself, I will get the second row as 0 and minus 5, which is nothing but the coefficients of the modified equation as we see on the left hand side. And of course, the right hand side also stands modified. The first element remains same as 4 because we have done nothing to it. Since we have replaced the second equation, the second value becomes minus 15, which is nothing but the right hand side of this equation. You might find this elaborate explanation not worthwhile for the community of teachers who have assembled here. But again, I will remind you the purpose of this explanation is to indicate that perhaps such details might be essential to convey to our students, not all of whom would understand linear systems of equations really equally well. Anyway, now is the very simple step. Everybody will know now that how to solve this equation. I have 1 y plus 2 z equal to 4, 0 y minus 5 z equal to minus 15. From these two equations, we further multiply equation 2 by minus 5. Now, this is subtle. We had this 0 y minus 5 z equal to minus 15. Ordinarily, a student will know that this equation is nothing but minus 5 z equal to minus 15. Therefore, z is equal to 3. So, he will just divide minus 15 by 5 which is the coefficient of z because this term does not count. What a student will do naturally 
we want to indicate how to do it formally in the context of a matrix representation. Notice that we have got 1 here on this diagonal by using the previous operation. We now tell our students that we want to get 1 here because if the coefficient of z is 1, then whatever is the right hand side is actually the value of z. So, in fact, what they would intuitively do for finding out the value of z, namely divide this by the coefficient minus 5, we are actually trying to show that this is done by using the same fact. So, by doing this, we will get 1 y plus 2 z equal to 4 and 0 y plus 1 z equal to 3. This might appear trivial even to our students, but the idea is to tell them that by doing this, what I do is I get a coefficient matrix of this form. So, I have ones on the diagonal zeros on the lower triangular portion and a non-zero values or whatever values I get in the upper triangular portion. It is a 2 by 2 matrix. So, the notion of a triangular, upper triangular, lower triangular may not be very obvious here, but essentially we say that we wish to get a matrix from the coefficients which have ones on the diagonal and zeros be below the diagonal. Why? Because by putting these equations in this form which now we call equation 1 dash and equation 2 dash starting with the last equation, we can use a back substitution and get the solution for all variables. The last equation itself does not require any substitution, we directly get z equal to 3. Why? Because this coefficient equation represents 0 into y plus 1 into z equal to 3, 0 into y plus 1 into z equal to 3, that is this equation, which means z is equal to 3. So, we say we have identified one solution. Having obtained this solution z, we substitute the value of z in the previous equation. The previous equation was 1 y plus 2 z equal to 4. When we put the value of z which was 3 here, we get 1 y plus 2 into 3 equal to 4, which gives us y plus 6 equal to 4 and which therefore gives us y equal to minus 2. If we had more equations, we can tell our students, we can keep on doing this. This, this process is called back substitution. So, we keep finding out values of the variables at the bottom, move upwards by substituting the values of those variables whose uh, results we have found and finally, we will get values of all the variables. This in short is the method of Gauss elimination. So, we note that the essence of the method is to reduce the coefficient matrix to an upper diagonal matrix with all elements on the diagonal as 1 and then we use back substitution. We note that the process is susceptible to round of errors. Why? Because in practice, the coefficients will not be nice ones as 1, 5, 3, etc. In real life, for example, if you are simulating chemical processes or as I said, you are doing some finite element analysis. We are not even talking about differential or partial differential equation sets, but there are many, many situations where you get a large number of simultaneous equations to be solved whose coefficients are arbitrary real numbers. And if there are arbitrary real numbers, we know that when we represent such real numbers by floating point numbers inside, we have the problem of limited precision. In particular, we recall that if a large value is added to or subtracted from a very small value, the result may not be significantly different from the original value. That is what we say is the impact of the limited precision we can have. We just noted at this stage in the first course. Uh, after all, this is not a course on solution of linear equations. This is a course on algorithms, programming and so on. But we are taking this example to show how matrix manipulation is done in C programming. If our students are interested and if we are so mathematically inclined, we might indicate that there are other variations such as Gauss-Jordan elimination, pivoting, LU decomposition. Many of you would recall these to be the standard techniques which are used in uh, several cases. We also note a useful reference. This is the reference that I mentioned, numerical recipes in C. Actually, this original book was numerical recipes in Fortran. Then when C language came about, they introduced the same numerical recipes in C. Subsequently, when C++ came, they wrote the book, rewrote the book in numerical recipes in C++. There is an interesting dilemma which these people also faced. This is what was raised by some of our participants also. Why does C indexing start with 0 when we naturally index our matrices or our way of looking at it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 
Interestingly, the same problem afflicted the authors of this book who had written it originally in Fortran and as many of you will know, Fortran arrays are referenced, uh, their elements are referenced by referring to them as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to the side. So what they did when they wrote the book in numerical recipes in C is that they wrote a whole lot of backend software called, uh, they, they wrote actually their own function library such that in the actual algorithms they could use indexes 1 to n. Consequently, while this book implements all the algorithms rigorously, it is slightly odd. Why? Because if we want to ever use any other functions that we write in terms of the arrays that they deploy, it becomes extremely difficult because our arrays we will refer to between 0 to whatever n, whereas they will refer to 0 to n minus 1, whereas they will be referring it to 1 to n. They have corrected this in the C++ editions. By and large, this is one of the best books, by the way. Some of you might want to just have this book because of the excellent treatment of variety of numerical analysis problems that the book offers. These are the authors and, and the book is extremely popular amongst numerical scientists. We now proceed to look at the generalization of what we have just seen through an example. This then is the general representation. We say that a system of linear equations in n variables can be represented by a11, a12, a13, a1n, x1, x2, x3, xn equal to b1. a21 into x1, a22 into x2, a23 into x3, etc., a2n into xn is equal to b2. In short, an n by n coefficient matrix and an n valued right hand side represents a system of n linear equations. We now note that while we as human beings might be accustomed to this notation of referring to coefficients of as a11, a12, a1n, etc., since the C programming language uses for its matrix indexes the notation from 0 to n minus 1, it is worthwhile for us to treat this system of equation as if it is represented like this a0, 0, a0, 1, a0, 2, etc. up to a0, n minus 1, a1, 0, a1, 1, a1, 2, etc. up to a1, n minus 1, and so on. And our variables, instead of calling them as x1, x2, x3, we call them as x0, x1, x2. Why? Because clearly then, the conventional matrix, both one-dimensional and two-dimensional, of C programming language, using the index expression rules of C programming language, can map one to one onto this system of simultaneous equations. And when we do it at this stage, it is not very hard, particularly to programming students who are already accustomed to array indexes being between 0 to n. We go to the previous slide, show them that this is what we, you will find in mathematics books or this is what you might have studied in your school algebra or this is what you will be studying in your engineering or science algebra. However, since you know how C programming treats arrays, for our purposes, we shall treat this equation to be like this. There is absolutely no change except for the nomenclature. I have found that most students immediately understand this, particularly you show both the things side by side. Problem arises if we start only with this kind of representation and never compare it with the conventional representation. So this is one rule I have learnt in teaching. Whenever we are introducing anything new as far as possible, relate it to something that students already know and then indicate the variation. Now we know that the Gaussian elimination technique essentially reduces the coefficient matrix to an upper triangular form. So the C style matrix will have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 on this diagonal, we'll have zeros below. Notice that this is now an upper triangular matrix because the coefficients will be a01, a02, etc. up to a0, n minus 1, a12, a13, etc. up to a1, n minus 1, and so on. And of course, these are the variables with the appropriate right hand side values. Once we reduce this, we can tell students how I can do simple matrix operation. The last value xn will be simply equal to bn. I can use this to back substitute in the previous equation and so on. 
we shall now look at the computational implementation of this particular problem. We note in general the representation in C style will be that I shall have a two dimensional matrix A, I will have a one dimensional array X and I will have a one dimensional array B. The two dimensional matrix A will contain the coefficients which originally would be all arbitrary values filled up in the n by n matrix starting from 0 to n minus 1 for rows and 0 to n minus 1 for columns. The x matrix is trivial, we just define it, it is a placeholder actually, it will not contain anything for most of the operations except in the end when using back substitution we are going to find out the values of the variables. So, these x matrix will represent actually our results and it will get filled up as we know because of the back substitution not from x0, x1, but first we will calculate xn, then xn minus 1, xn minus 2 and so on. We note in particular that if we recall our Gauss elimination technique that we have seen, then after the steps which lead to modification of the left hand side coefficient matrix and of course the corresponding modifications on the right hand side, we will get the coefficient matrix in the upper triangular form and then we will have the following system which using back substitution we can solve for x. What will that be? x0 plus a01 into x1 plus a02 into x2 etc. a0 n minus 1 into xn minus 1 equal to b0. x1 plus whatever whatever lastly plus a1 n minus 1 into xn minus 1 is equal to b1. Notice that because the coefficient matrix has 1 on the diagonals the coefficients of x0, x1, x2, etc. will be 1. And now if we see very easily the back substitution means xn minus 1 is directly equal to bn minus 1. We substitute this value back and we get xn minus 2, substitute it back we get xn minus 3, etc., etc. Substitute it back we get x1, substitute all those values back we get x0. A small question, is this elaborate explanation necessary? My answer is yes. I have tried shorter explanations, some of the smarter students in the class understand that very easily. Those who have been playing with simultaneous equations for a long time in their uh, school days or have picked it up in their first year engineering, in the maths portion they can understand it very quickly. But there are a large number of people who are significantly benefited by some elaborate discussion of the Gauss element. So, the question I am often asked by my colleagues, is this a programming course or is this a mathematics course? Thankfully, our course is named Computer Programming and Utilization. As I told you, we do not name the language that we use, although we use a combination of C, C++ for teaching programming principles. But traditionally, we take up an application, explain what that application is about, explain the underlying algorithm and then work out how the C programming implementation will be which is what we shall now proceed to achieve. We further illustrate our computations in terms of C matrices. Consider our example equations in two variables, 2y plus 4z equal to 20, y plus 3z equal to 11. We represent y by x0 and z by x1, then this will be represented as this. So, a00 into x0, etc. where a00 is 2, a01 is 4, a10 is 4, a11 is 3. They are namely the coefficients here. Okay. Now, we write the C program. Once again, I will remind you the only reason why I am calling this Gauss.cpp is because I am going to use C in and C out. Other than C in and C out, there is no feature in our programs which does not match one to one with the features of C. So, we are essentially writing C programs, but including input output statements of C++ for the reasons that I had mentioned earlier. So, for that purpose I of course have to say include IO stream using namespace std etc. I declare all my variables and arrays, i, j, k, n are common sense indexing variables that I will use, n is the size of the system of equation. I define mat a as matrix a, mat b as matrix b and x as the variable matrix. I describe as divisor, factor and sum as float these are the computational variables or placeholders that I will require during my computations. I have the usual input portion which reads all the values, 
I read a matrix A first, since I have to, it is an n by n matrix, I start by reading n and then I read the coefficient matrix in row order. So, for first row I equal to 0, I read all the columns, then for row uh, I equal to 1, that is second row, I read all the columns, etc. I do exactly the same thing in matrix B. Matrix B is a single dimensional array, so there is only one column. For I equal to 0 to n minus 1, I read all the elements of matrix B. Having obtained the input, I now proceed to do the Gauss elimination. Since we have discussed an example of a 2 by 2 equation system, it is not very difficult for our students to understand these things very quickly. What I do? Divide each row by the coefficients on the diagonal. People will recall that the purpose is to get 1 on the diagonal and therefore, multiplication for any system when I proceed uh, any row. So, I am starting with i equal to 0. So, I start with that row and in that row I make the coefficient of the diagonal 1. So, I calculate the divisor mat a i i which is the diagonal on the i th row. Please note I am starting with the 0 th row and please also note that before I complete this for any row I would have got by the elimination zeros in the lower triangular portion. So, for this row I say divisor is mat a i i and I simply say mat a i i equal to 1.0, I am forcing it to 1 and now recalculate all coefficients in that row. So, for j equal to i plus 1, j less than n, j plus plus, I recalculate the i comma j th coefficient of mat a by dividing itself by divisor, divisor is the diagonal element. Why I do not do that for even i i? Please note that mat i i is desired to be 1. I am dividing each row by the coefficients on the diagonal in order to get that as 1. There is absolutely therefore no harm in forcing that to be exact 1 or as close to 1 as possible because we know that internally the decimal fractional numbers and binary fractional numbers in which form the computer stores or number do not have 1 to 1 match and that is because 1 by 10 cannot be translated into an exact binary fraction. That is a matter which we have not yet discussed. I would uh, suggest that uh, the teachers amongst groups deliberate on this issue to discover what is the implication. Anyway, now normalize the corresponding right hand side element because I have to divide the right hand side element also by same, I get this. So far, so good. All that I have achieved is I have taken each row and converted the element on the diagonal to 1. Now, replace subsequent rows by subtracting the appropriate portion of the ith equation from it. So, I am considering ith equation, initially i is 0. So, for if i plus 1 is less than n, because I should have a subsequent row. If I am already at the last row, there is nothing else to be modified. So, I just check whether there exists i plus 1. That means, i plus 1 should be less than n at most it should be equal to n minus. Then for a value of k varying from i plus 1 to less than n, I do the following. I calculate the factor which is mat a k comma i and I set mat k comma i to 0 because that is the purpose of the elimination. Notice what we are doing. We are now reducing the matrix row by row into an upper triangular form. So, just as I force the diagonal element to 1, I force the k comma of i element to 0 because that is what I am going to achieve after the substitution. And what do I do after the substitution, not after substitution, after the uh, subtraction of a linear combination and so on, which is what we attempt. So, for j equal to i plus 1 to n minus 1, that means for all the elements in the i plus 1 th row, I calculate mat a k j equal to mat a k j minus factor times mat a i j. So, mat a i j is the, uh, the deciding row, its multiple that is factor I am subtracting from the kth row corresponding j th element. The multiple of each row when subtracted from kth row, it will not be the same factor. So, notice the factor is calculated separately for kth row. So, each kth row has one factor, all operations on the kth row are done using that factor. When I have completed that, I will have to do the same factor reduction in the right hand side matrix B k. 
So, I calculate mat B k is equal to mat B k minus factor into mat B r. When this iteration finishes, let us just look at couple of iterations. Initially, i is 0. So, i plus 1 is 1. So, I start with k equal to 1 to n minus 1. So, for each row, second, third, fourth, fifth or the uh, row, uh, in, uh, index number 1, 2, 3, 4, plane minus 1, let us take the next row. First row, I have got 1 on the diagonal. Second row, the first element I am setting to 0 because it is below the diagonal. The next row I am has been already set to 1, the next element because all diagonal element we converted into 1. So, now I am saying for j equal to i plus 1, I calculate mat k j equal to this, mat b k is equal to this. At the end of this, I would have got the entire matrix into an upper diagonal form with the right hand side coefficient matrix representing the effect of all these operations, correct. Notice how small the code is. So, it is not that one has to write very lengthy programs to implement even a complex process such as Gauss elimination. Now, I do the back substitution starting with the last variable. As we observed, the last variable is simply the right hand side coefficient. So, x n minus 1 is equal to matrix b n minus 1. And then for i equal to n minus 2 to 0, that is I go backwards. In decrement of 1, notice that this says i minus minus. I will sum up i th row using values uh, of x already determined. So, sum is 0, j is equal to i plus 1 for j less than n, j plus plus. Sum is equal to sum plus mat a i j into x j. What am I doing? These xj's represent the values which I already found out. I am multiplying the already found out values with the coefficients and I am summing them up. So, in a particular row where the diagonal is 1 and other coefficients are there, I am using the values of the remaining elements which I have found, substituting them here. I have only one unknown in this equation which is xi. So, the unknown values are i plus 1, i plus 2, i plus 3, etcetera, etcetera. I calculate xi by subtracting from right hand side mat b i the sum that I have calculated. This is back substitution. Let us very briefly go over this again to consolidate our thought processes. I read the two matrices a and b. For the Gauss elimination, I divide each row by coefficients on the diagonal. Effectively, I normalize, I, I, I convert all the elements on the diagonal to be one on the coefficient matrix and correspondingly normalize the right hand side. Then I do the Gauss elimination technique implementation of getting the entire coefficient matrix in upper triangular form. For that, I do that subtraction of a, of a linear combination of one equation from the other kind of stuff and I will get all of these done. At the end, I use back substitution to calculate values of all my variables. Finally, I output the results. Well, for good measure, I also output the matrices. So, this is one matrix A, this is another matrix B. And then for i equal to 0 to n minus 1, I print the values of x. Notice a very funny kind of printing because I am printing a string x opening bracket. Then I am printing the value of i. Then I am printing a string closing bracket, ease, colon. This is merely to get some meaningful printout as we shall see in a moment. Then finally, I print x i which is the value and go to the next line. Now, here is the question. I have used C in and C out. In an actual program, you may use scan f and print f. It does not matter. But what is important is that every time you run this program, you will have to give that input by typing in values on the keyboard. If you have to give a few values, which is what we have seen in most of our algorithms, it is not a problem. But imagine if it is a matrix, imagine it is a 10 by 10 matrix. So, you have to give 100 values, not actually 100, you have to give first n, which is 10, then you have to give row by row 10, 10, 10, so 100 values, plus you have to give the 10 values on the right hand side. So, 111 values you have to type. Now, suppose you run this program and you find there is some problem, the program is not working properly. You go back, check that program, correct it, run it again. Again, you have to type in 110 values. 
this seems silly. For that purpose, we look for some shortcuts. Fortunately, the Unix operating system provides us with that shortcut. In fact, there are some other facilities I would like to discuss both of them at this juncture. So, as I observed ordinarily, we use the keyboard to give our input data and screen to see the output values. But if you have to repeatedly execute a program during trials, then the same input has to be given again and again. Also, once a program executes, if its output comes on the screen, we know, read that all right. But next time when we run it again after making some changes, we get some other output. Usually, we would like to compare this output with the previous output, but the previous output has gone with the screen. So, getting output only on screen, it is good, provided I am just running a program to get final results, the program is perfectly working. But during the development stage, I may want to retain the output of these programs at least two or three major runs for comparison purposes later. Just as you saw when I, I had shown you the results uh, by running the pi estimation program using time. How do you do that? Well, this is the objective to see here. If the input values are large in number, we know we can store these numbers in a file. What is a file? It is a text file like our program file. Such a file is pre-edited and it contains the required input data in the prescribed format. For example, roll marks dot text. We have roll numbers and corresponding mark. Roll number mark, roll number mark, roll number mark. That could be one format. In this particular case also, we could prepare our input data in the desired format. The question is, how do we make my computer read data not from keyboard, but from a file? For that, there is a very simple facility called a redirection. When we use C in greater greater this, or when we use scanf in our C programs, actually the operating system gives our C program a standard input file called std in. std in by the operating system is normally connected to keyboard. So, whenever our scanf is executed in C program, or whenever C i n is executed in C++ program or C program, then what happens is that the operating system connects that to a stream of bytes coming from the keyboard. That is why all input is read from the keyboard. However, the Unix operating system can redirect that std in. We can tell operating system that look, while you execute this program, please do not connect std in to keyboard as you normally do, but instead connected to something else. And what is that something else? Well, a file which contains the desired data in the desired format, which of course, we would have pre-prepared. Consequently, instead of simply saying dot slash a dot out, if we say dot slash a dot out less than input data dot text, please do not confuse this less than or greater than sign as we see here with the greater greater less less sign which we use inside the program. C in and C out are the programming instructions which are used inside the program. Here we are talking about the operating system instruction, not the dollar prompt. So, this is not what you write ever inside your program, but this is the command that you give to the operating system. After compiling your program, if you say dot slash a dot out less than input data dot txt, this less than symbol is called input redirection. That means, for this program in its entirety, now the keyboard will be disabled. So, you would not be giving any data on the keyboard because operating system has decided that you do not want keyboard to be standard input file. Instead, you want input data dot txt file to be treated as standard input file. So, operating system will automatically open this file, start reading bytes from this file. It is our responsibility to ensure that the text which is inside this file actually represent the values in exactly the same form in which we would have typed it on the keyboard. So, same blank space between two values or line feed whatever, whatever. Similarly, it is possible to redirect all output to a named file. Just as operating system as std in which is connected to keyboard, the operating system also has std out which is called a standard output and which by default is connected to our monitor. That is the reason why whenever we say C out or printf for that matter, the output comes on our screen. Because 
the C operating system simply gives a standard out file and C out or printf write to that output file. Since that file is connected by the operating system to our monitor, that is where we see things. But if we use the redirection by saying dot slash a dot out greater than output data file dot text in our command line, then instead of any output coming to the screen, that output will go to that file. That file can be later on examined. Please note that both redirections can be used simultaneously. This is important and useful for us because now we can run this program maybe four times during trial, every time giving a different name for this file. Note that this file does not pre-exist, input file must pre-exist, but the output file is created by the operating. So let us say output data file 1, output data file 2, output data file 3 or output data file 3rd July, output data file 4th July, we can use meaningful names for our trials. And later on we can print these files and compare the results. It makes it extremely easy for us to compare things across multiple executions. In any case, the most important advantage for us is that in a limited time, if you want to run this program multiple times, you do not have to type the large number of values that will accompany us. So far in our labs also, you have been giving only small values. You will realize that the same thing will be happening to your students. Later on, when with your students, you declare large data handling, you, you discuss large data handling, there could be serious problems. 